The sea squirt is a fascinating little critter. It's quite pretty. There it is. Lives most of its life in the water, filtering seawater through its tubes and getting its food. It isn't always that sedentary, though. In its youthful stage, it's a free-swimming organism, getting out, exploring the world around it, having a good time. But that youthful exuberance can't continue forever. After a while, it finds a rock, settles down, anchors itself, and that's where it's going to be for the rest of its life. But what to do for food until it gets the pretty blue glance? Well, it eats its brain. <laughs> Think about it. If you're not going to move anymore, you don't need a brain. <laughs> Big or small, nature shows us, from a giant redwood to a tiny little mosquito, if you're not going to move, you don't have a brain. If you are going to move, then you have some capacity to think. So that turns out to tell us interesting things about the world of humans and robots and artificial intelligence. In the field of artificial intelligence, there's breakthroughs happening all the time. Indeed, breakthroughs are constantly coming at us faster and faster. The pace of our world is changing. And if you think you can keep up today, well, what about tomorrow? Within artificial intelligence, a couple of years ago, an amazing thing happened in the field of game playing, which is a subpart of artificial intelligence. A program called AlphaGo was written by a group called DeepMind, and AlphaGo was given all of the accumulated knowledge about Go. Go is computationally far more difficult than chess, and with lots and lots of training and playing against experts, finally it was matched up against the world champion, and people thought, no way can an artificial intelligence take on a human. This is one of the things that only we can do. And lo and behold, the artificial intelligence beat the human. But something far more fundamental happened the following year and didn't get quite as much attention, but quite a bit more important. A new program called AlphaGo Zero was written, and they didn't give it the benefit of human knowledge. They just showed it black stones, white stones, here's how you play the game. And they set it up playing against the champion program from the year before. In a flash, computer to computer speed, it became the champion. It would beat AlphaGo 100 games to none. And in doing so, it developed plays that after thousands of years of playing the game, humans had never even considered. It was like playing with an alien. But AlphaGo Zero isn't going anywhere. It's not getting out and about. But with the advent of self-driving trucks and cars, with, ultra, with unmanned aerial vehicles and drones, our robots, formerly fixed to the factory floor, are, like the young sea squirt, getting out and about and exploring their environment. And as they do, we see that the artificial intelligence that makes that possible become more mobile, become smarter, and start to look like something we would recognize as a brain. Soon we're going to have to reassess our whole relationship with technology. There are two major waves of change sweeping over us. The first has already started, and that's the age where we have specialist artificial, pro artificial intelligence programs called narrow AI and robotics. Together, they're going to make us question very much who we are and how we order our society. The second wave is even more fundamental. In about a couple of decades, but certainly within the lifetime of most of us here today, we're going to see an artificial general intelligence, one that has the capacity of all of us combined. And that will be like sharing the planet with a new life form. These are slightly scary, or maybe very scary changes, but how we handle them and how we handle that second wave is really dependent on the first. So let's look back at history and see how good we humans are at handling major change. <laughs> you can see where this is going. <laughs> Up until 1400, books were a very rare commodity. They were typically produced by monks in scriptoriums. The monk would spend a whole lifetime producing just a couple of volumes, beautiful works of art, but expensive, rare, and literacy, of course, was correspondingly low. All that changes in 1440 when Gutenberg invents the printing press. And suddenly, we can print all sorts of things. We can print pamphlets, political tracts, and yes, Bibles. 
But do the monks rise up and try and smash the printing press? No. First of all, they were fairly peaceful people to start with. But <laughs> this isn't a sudden, in-your-face, existential change. It's a gradual one. And today, we're still seeing people try and control what comes off the printing presses, but the printing presses themselves are being left alone. Dial it forward a few hundred years more to 1700, and weaving, taking cloth, making cloth and selling it was literally a cottage industry. The whole family would be, gathered in, would be involved in gathering wool, spinning it, producing textiles, and that was how they would put food on the table. But with mechanization, along comes the spinning jenny, the jacquard loom, and suddenly the home weaver cannot compete. And with no social safety net, suddenly they have no way to put food on the table. One of the lessons from history is that people will put up with an amazing amount of stuff, but if you deny them a way to feed their children, you have sown the seeds of revolution. And sure enough, by the early 1800s, the British had more troops in England fighting the machine breakers, or Luddites as they came to be known, than they did in the continent fighting against Napoleon. So today we stand at a fork in the road. New technology brings great promise, but also great disruption. How we handle that is up to us. We get to choose. What we don't get to do is choose not to have the technology. Once it's invented, it stays invented. You cannot put the genie back in the bottle. So in this new world of technology, who wouldn't want self-driving cars? They're safer. They all learn from any mistakes they make rather than us each and learning one at a time. Who wouldn't want more efficient deliveries and all the things that come with it? Well, consider the job of truck driver that's about to disappear. One of the most common jobs in North America today that gives you a decent income without a higher education. Consider as well the job of the cab driver. Consider not only those folks, but the diner and the motel along the way that house and feed those, tr those drivers. Those are all going away, and they're going away very, very soon. Now, some politicians will tell you that they're going to bring back declining industries, things like coal mining. <laughs> and, you know, with policy changes, perhaps they will. But if they bring back the industries, they won't bring back the workers. A modern coal mine is going to use robots, not humans. In the oil sands of northern Alberta, you see the giant trucks being now self-driving. And it's more efficient, it reduces the, uh, the footprint, it's more economically enviable, might actually get a pipeline through to BC. There's all sorts of good things that could happen from this. But who wouldn't want this? Well, ask an unemployed truck driver. So at this point, typically, a speaker will tell you that, yes, yes, this is all very disruptive, but just like the textile workers who eventually became factory workers, or the graphic designers who moved into being web designers, new jobs will come along, and all those old jobs that you didn't really want will go away to the machines. But this time is different, because the machines are catching up to human-level capabilities. Do you really think that your job, whatever it is, can't be done by a super-efficient computer or a tireless robot or a combination of the two? And if you, your job can't be done, then why the new jobs can't be done by those as well? So we're facing the situation where we do have to compete with the machines for a while. But is this going to happen quickly, or do we have time to think about it and get used to the idea? Well, I've already mentioned the pace of change. If we look back in history again, in the four years of the First World War between 1914 and 1918, an entire empire came about. An entire social order, class system fell apart. The world changed radically in just a few years at a time in history when we think of the pace of change as having been glacial. What about now? This was brought home to me a few years ago when I attended a geophysical conference and looked at a number of presenters talking about newly discovered planets. All the presenters were introduced as exobiologists. And I thought, what the heck's an exobiologist? It's the scientist who studies the possibilities of life around a newly discovered planet. But those exobiologists had remade themselves into exobiologists in just a couple of years from the mission launch, less time than it takes to get an undergraduate degree in biology. 
So if things are changing that fast, how do we keep up? If it's faster than our, we can get an education, faster than we can pass a regulation or legislation, what do we do? Well, let's take a look at the legal system and see if perhaps it might be made a little more nimble. And surprisingly, that takes us to the curious case of glue sniffing in Glasgow. <laughs> in the early 1980s in the UK, there was an epidemic of glue sniffing all through the UK. And this was a real problem because, well, obviously it's, a, it's terribly harmful, um, but there was no law against it. The glue was not illegal. The plastic bags the children were using was not illegal. And then, believe it or not, some enterprising corner store merchants came up with the idea that some poor children couldn't participate because they couldn't afford a whole bottle of glue. So they started measuring little bits of glue into plastic bags and making glue sniffing kits and selling them to children. <laughs> the moral compass? Hmm, don't know. Anyway. Um, the police said stop it. They said, no, no, we can't because it's not illegal. Um, the system in most of Canada, in England, is common law. So there's statutes, things that Parliament has said are illegal, and things that are known to be illegal based on precedents. So to fix this in England, or most of Canada, you'd have to pass new laws. And that means committees and sending things up and sending things back and sending them off to the Queen to get it signed and so on. And eventually, while all children are being harmed, you get a law. In Scotland, however, their system is based not just on common law, but also civil law. And in civil law, it's not the precedent that matters, it's the principle. And in Scottish law, it's illegal to harm children. So they promptly arrested these chaps and stick them in jail for three years. And the High Court Justice said at appeal, it would be a poor thing if the law could not handle offenses arising in modern times. So perhaps there's hope for the legal system to become a bit more flexible. In Canada, by the way, Quebec's system is also incorporating um, that French civil law. So let's go to another wise Scotsman, because I'm fond of wise Scotsmen. Um, Adam Smith in 1776 writes The Wealth of Nations and lays down the fundamentals of capitalism. With that, he talks about mostly the division and pricing of labor. But if all labor is being done by machines, where does that leave capitalism? It takes the very basis out from underneath it. So as we move forward with robot factories producing the goods that we need from the raw materials that are out in the land, then if those factories and robots are owned by a few oligarchs, you will have a few super rich people and the rest of us hoping for the patronage of those. A world of massive inequality. Another approach could be that we assert that the ownership of all those resources belongs to the people who live in the land, and we implement something called universal basic income. Now, universal basic income, UBI, is generally thought of as a support for the poor. But remember, we're all going to be giving our jobs to the robots. So who gets the UBI? Well, that would be all of us. So we really need to have a conversation about UBI. With UBI, everybody has enough to live without actually having a job to go to. Some of us will not rise to the challenge. <laughs> but some of us will. We'll explore, we'll discover what really makes us ourselves. And, and in doing that, we'll get to explore the nature of human nature. What is it that defines us? Is it just our job? I hope not. I hope it's something more. But with that, we have to hurry because time is running out. That only takes us to the end of that first wave of change. The second wave of change is the artificial general intelligence. We know the difference between a chimp and a human. We know the difference between the IQ of the proverbial village idiot, not a lot, and Einstein at 160 to 165. But can we comprehend the IQ of a new being that has an IQ of 5,000? Because make no mistake, the AI train isn't going to stop at the human station. It's going barreling right through to a destination that we cannot even understand. So what are we going to do about that? Well, there are certainly challenges. There's a lot of promise. Wouldn't you want to have a friend with an IQ of 5,000 look, looking out for you? But you wouldn't want to have somebody who didn't like you. We've faced existential crisis in the past. We thought that the plagues of the Middle Age would kill us all and it was the end of the world, but it wasn't. More recently, when the first hydrogen bombs were exploded, not the atomic bombs, but the hydrogen bomb, many scientists, credible scientists, thought that the chain reaction would not stop with the bomb because there's a lot of hydrogen in the atmosphere 
and they would strip the entire atmosphere off the earth, leaving the planet lifeless. Why on earth would you do it? Well, the American argument at the time was, well, if we don't, the Russians will, so better dead than red, fire her up. <laughs> Luckily, we survived. Recently, um, concerned citizens sued to try and stop CERN from starting up the Large Hadron Collider, fearing that we would create a, a mini black hole and then we would all get sucked into it. Um, if we are being sucked into the black hole, we wouldn't know it at this point, because from the outside we'd be gone, but we would seem... Anyway, that's another thing. <laughs> We've survived, that's good. So why should we fear a new super-intelligent being? Well, chances are it will have no hostility towards us. But this new artificial general intelligence may come out of a controlled research lab, but it may suddenly, in the software equivalent of a nuclear chain reaction, come out of a project to find the gazillionth bit digit of pi, or perhaps from a factory that's trying to maximize the production of paper clips. We would simply be in the way. I'm sure that the people who built this fine theater had nothing against the ants and gophers that lived here before, but they still poured the concrete. So, if this is the case, all we can do, just like a parent raising a child, is try and create the initial conditions that will be most favorable to having this new superintelligence favorable to us. These are going to be wildly turbulent times, so fasten your seatbelt, folks, because as it goes forward, we have to get this first stage right. We have to figure out how to handle the changes to our economy, to our legal system, to our ability to define ourselves by who we work, so that the AGI, the artificial general intelligence, rises from a kind society rather than a mean one. And that adjacent possible is absolutely magical and could be the golden age for humanity. So let's really try and get it right. Thank you.